Hey guys, welcome to the first part of my review series for Topps Adaptation of The Lost World Jurassic Park. I'm pretty excited to jump into this new series, and I hope all of you are too. With all of that being said, let's go ahead and begin. On the coast of some mysterious island sits Paul Bowman. It's taken the man 40 years of hard work to afford his luxurious yacht, and he uses such an award to sail away to wherever he pleases. Today, he felt like it was a good idea to spend lunch with his family on the beach of this island, but his daughter Kathy is more interested in exploring than spending time with her parents. Her mother tries to call her back to the spot that they've chosen to eat at, but Kathy ignores her, and instead continues to wander off on her own. And then... She's suddenly greeted with the appearance of a small green creature. The girl takes an interest in this peculiar looking animal and offers it some of the food that she's taken with her. This animal takes a bite out of the treat that Kathy offered and sends the girl into a wave of excitement. She calls out to her parents, telling them to come see this odd little thing that she's found before the little green creature is joined by many, many others. Now moving as a full pack, these compies surround Kathy Bowman and quickly turn her excitement into fear. It isn't long before her parents hear the sound of Kathy screaming in the distance. This makes them immediately get up and run to their daughter's aid. And when they finally do get to her, they see something that will haunt them for the rest of their lives. 48 hours later, a yawning Peter Ludlow uses this moment to survey the board members who've gathered in the room. And after he's passed around photographs of Kathy Bowman's extensive injuries, he begins his speech. Just two days ago, the British family happened to stumble upon Site B. Her wealthy parents, of course, decided to sue the owners of the island. Ludlow reminds his associates that this is nothing new to them. Family of Donald Gennaro, 36.5 million. Family of John Arnold, 25 million. Family of Robert Muldoon, 12.6 million. Destroyed equipment, 17.3 million. And deconstruction of Nublar's facilities alone cost the company 126 million dollars. Ludlow makes it very clear to his peers that this madness must stop. Their money has been spent dry and engine has been bleeding from the throat for four years. They've done nothing but spend money when they could have used the time harvesting their valuable assets and turning them into profit for the company. The one and only thing that stands in their way from getting back on their feet is a born-again naturalist who happens to be their own CEO, Ludlow's own uncle. Nevertheless, Peter understands the seriousness of such a situation and uses this information as the basis for his move to hold a vote for the resolution that John Parker Hammond be removed from the office of Chief Executive Officer effective immediately before asking his peers if he has a second for the motion. And with a show of hands, the poll stands unanimous. Meanwhile, Dr. Malcolm waits in an urban subway. Scornful eyes recognize him as a crazed lunatic. Even though I gotta say, can't blame him Ian, what's with the mustache? Another passenger makes his way towards the chaotician, before asking if he was the same man that he'd seen on TV. And after making a sarcastic remark, the passenger roars into Malcolm's face, disrespecting him as a fool for everyone in attendance to see. Malcolm's sullen attitude intensifies the moment he sees Ludlow exiting John Hammond's bedroom. He hates this man and would rather knock him on his ass than talk with him. Their conversation escalates the same way it usually does. Malcolm's name had been dragged through the mud once he'd told the public about the existence of cloned dinosaurs. With Injun denying every word he breathed, it of course made the chaotician look crazy. This encounter ends a bit differently from their usual sparring after Ludlow reveals to Malcolm that the company is now his responsibility and that he will generously defend its interests. In a few days' time, Peter promises that all of Ian's problems will be forgotten, but Malcolm isn't so sure. As soon as Ian opens the door to John's room, he quickly notices the medical equipment that's being hidden behind a wall of flowers and pictures of children. He takes a mental note of this and comes to realize the truth that the old man's illness will probably win the battle. But Hammond is just as joyful as he was back on Nublar. He welcomes Ian in and gives him the rundown on why he's been summoned to John's lavish home. Genetic engineering of Jurassic Park's magnitude requires a far larger scale of production than just the little lab that he'd shown his visitors during their stay on the island. Isla Sorna, Site B, was actually the factory floor. They bred the animals there and then waited until they were old enough to be moved into the park. But after the hurricane hit the island, they had to evacuate and leave the animals to fend for themselves. Luckily, the animals have somehow managed to survive without any intervention from man. After hearing that last part, Malcolm becomes relieved that no one is around these creatures. Before John tells him that he's organized an expedition to the island, 
Nick Van Owen, Eddie Carr, a paleontologist, and hopefully Ian himself will travel to the island and document these animals alive in their natural habitats for him. Malcolm, of course, shoots down the offer immediately before Hammond reveals the reasoning for his organization of this research trip. After a British family stumbled across the island, their little girl was injured, and the resulting lawsuit was the final nail in the coffin for John's career. The board of directors used the incident to take Injun away from him and plan on going to the island to harvest the animals in an effort to bail themselves out. He could preserve it and keep both the animals and the public safe, but in order to do that, he needs to rally public support by showing the world all of the animals alive and living in their natural habitats. Again, Ian disagrees. In fact, he makes it known that he's going to call the other members of Hammond's team and call off the expedition. But after asking for the name of the paleontologist, Malcolm is given the worst news he could imagine. John assures the chaotician that she approached him and not the other way around, but Ian can't stand the fact that Hammond actually let Sarah Harding, his girlfriend, go to this island alone. They'd met each other after Ian had his terrible accident in the park. Sarah traveled all the way to a Costa Rican hospital to ask someone who she didn't even know if the rumors about living dinosaurs were true. He knew that she couldn't resist the opportunity to go and study them in such a pristine environment. Ian lets John know that he will never forgive him for this, and that what he's organized is no longer a research expedition, it's a rescue operation, and it starts now. Elsewhere, in a Mombasan bar sits Roland Timbo, a man in his late 60s who hates it when tourists disrupt his favorite spot, and if they don't stop harassing their waitress, he's gonna stop them himself. Suddenly, Roland smells something familiar and immediately recognizes the odor that belongs to his dear friend Ajay. He can't believe he actually wears the cheap aftershave that he buys him every Christmas. Roland tells Ajay to take a seat next to him and asks what on earth has brought him to Bambasa. Roland learns of a unique expedition that's being funded near Costa Rica, and Ajay wanted to know if he was up for one final adventure. Immediately shutting him down, Roland reveals to us that he thinks he's been just a little bit too successful during his hunts. There was no real thrill anymore. They were both too overqualified. Suddenly, the tourists begin to get a little too hands-on with their waitress, prompting Roland to get up and put an end to such heathen behavior. He picks a fight with the man responsible for pissing him off, who states that he could easily take Roland with a hand tied behind his back. And after having his own hand tied behind his back, Roland approaches his opponent and knocks him in the jaw. After the fight has ended, Ajay unties Roland's hand and begins to reason with him. He broke that man's jaw for no other reason than his own boredom. Roland must have some interest in this expedition's quarry. The old man tells his friend to go up to his ranch, take a look around the trophy room, and then tell him what kind of quarry could possibly be of any interest to him. Ajay begins to smile. Deep within the mobile field system warehouse, Eddie Carr gives Ian Malcolm a crash course in the equipment that they'll be using but Malcolm can't seem to get any of it to cooperate with him. Now, Nick Van Owen pulls up to the garage and joins the two in prepping for their trip. Two Mercedes-Benz, a Fleetwood RV, and an elevated cage known as the High Hide will be going with them on their journey. Malcolm remains unimpressed. He moves into an office to begin a discussion with his daughter, who's just been dropped off. Kelly is 12 years old, and she doesn't give a damn that her parents are of different races. But their divorce has left her with an empty feeling, and Ian's constant absence doesn't help. She's having a difficult time accepting the fact that as soon as she gets dropped off to spend time with him, he's already arranged for her to be sent away so that he could leave again. She begs to go with him, but he of course says no. He doesn't want to reveal where he's actually going to her, and after a heated argument, ends the conversation by saying that if she wants some good parental advice, then she shouldn't listen to him. This leads Kelly to take the situation into her own hands. She rejects the idea of going somewhere else as soon as she's been left with her father, and instead climbs into the RV for a little planned surprise. And now, the expedition starts. Ian tells his associates that he's sure that John Hammond has already told them what they'd get to see on the island and that being sane people, he's sure that they don't believe him. He's also sure that they've concluded that he's out of his mind too. But please, he begs them not to take this island lightly. There are things on the island that can not only kill you, but that want to kill you. They need to be as careful as they can be. Eddie takes this moment to show Malcolm his Lindstrat air rifle. He's loaded it with the enhanced venom of the South Sea cone shell, the most powerful neurotoxin in the world. There's no antidote, so he assures Ian that they'll be extra careful during their journey. Now on the island, Nick, Ian, and Eddie gather around the handheld GPS that Eddie has brought with him. It's set to track Sarah's satellite phone and sends them on their way to meeting up with her. But it isn't long before they find that the signal has come to a halt. Sarah's backpack has been left in the forest, discarded, and torn. 
Nick offers to split up and make an effort at covering more ground, but Malcolm immediately disagrees, asserting that predators look for strays and that they need to stick together. Both of them now take the time to notice Eddie staring at something. Something big. Something really big. Now out of the jungle comes a huge herd of stegosaurs moving slowly in front of their path. And on the other side of them sits Sarah Harding, taking notes on such incredible creatures. Seeing each other, the group finally meets up. A very excited Sarah can't stop talking about the nurturing habits of these prehistoric beasts, but all Ian wants to know is whether or not she'd been attacked. Explaining this to be her lucky pack, which is always tattered and ragged, she quickly borrows a camera from Van Owen and heads back to the dinosaurs to take some pictures. Unfortunately, she tries to take more photos than the film reel has to offer, and the loud noise of the automatic rewinder puts the stegosaurs on high alert. They don't like this unrecognizable sound, and make their disapproval very clear. Quickly, Sarah takes a dive into a nearby log, and hides from the full force of the spiked tail that comes crashing down on top of her. Wow, I had no idea that this comic would be this long. Top's adaptation of The Lost Worlds seems to be very faithful to the script that Spielberg would shoot for his 1997 film. While this is really awesome, as it includes a ton of the deleted scenes that got cut from the big-budgeted sequel, I can't deny that I was super unaware of how much of the story they would choose to translate into comic form. Putting it bluntly, there's only four issues of this particular series, but they encompass huge parts of the movie, so they're way longer than normal. I'm not joking, much of the movie is word for word the same as it is in this 22-page comic book. That being said, I really love it. Seeing the deleted portions of the film added into the story is really cool, and I wish that the filmmakers would release a director's cut or something similar someday, so that The Lost World could be viewed with all of the excised scenes added in for extra fun. I know it's something that I would love to see, and sure many others would as well. It's interesting to read the words that reveal that Kelly is Malcolm's biological child, seeing as how I've always thought that she was adopted since Nick Van Owen and Eddie Carr's joke about family resemblance is in the film. Regardless, I find this to be an interesting revelation and something worth noting. Overall, I really enjoyed the first issue of this series and can't wait to read more. Some of the music that you heard in this video was composed by Daryl Lee Lynn. He's done an incredible job with a track that I've used extensively, and I would highly recommend him to anyone who's interested in a quality composition. I really appreciate being able to use your music, Daryl. It's really great. A link to his channel will be in the description below. Now, before I go, I want to thank my new game wardens, Lauren and Mullins, as well as my engine executives. I'd also like to thank all of my park workers and engine hunters. Lass, Nevada, and Sean, it means the world to get this kind of support from you guys, and I really appreciate what you all do for me. It's honestly really awesome of all of you. Now, I want to thank you all for taking the time to watch this video, and I hope that you all enjoyed today's content. If you feel like I deserve it, I would appreciate the like, and I hope that you'll consider subscribing if you're interested in hearing from me again. I'll see you all in the next video, guys. And as always, take it easy.